we start this new topic, um, which is monetary and fiscal policy. Um, monetary and fiscal policy are very strategic because the monetary and fiscal policy basically underlines the state's commitment towards the economic matters of the country. State, even though is a political entity, but it cannot remain aloof of the economic matters which the economies, the countries confront. It will be absolutely unacceptable on the part of the state if today there is a political crisis, it has the economic repercussions and the state says, it's not my job because I'm only meant to do the polity. That's not true. State has to monitor, state has to articulate, the state has to maneuver the economy. Or in simple words, the state has to fine tune the economy. This is a fine tuning. To fine tune the economy, it's like fine tuning your tally, your TV. Instead of one remote control that we have for the TV, the state has two remote controls. Even though it's not a good comparison, but it's somewhat parallel comparison. And the one remote control is called fiscal policy. Fiscal, as you can see from here. Yeah. In this policy, the state is very proactive, very upfront. There is a minister of the state, minister of finance, who's very open, prime minister, many other minist ministries, they get involved into managing the economic affairs of the country. You can see the lot of activism of the state around. You can see, sta you can see the state everywhere. You go to the road, there is a construction and that construction is done by the state. You go to the hospital, the hospital building is under construction and the, construct, the, the one who construct is a, is a state. So you basically feel and see the state almost in every nook and corner. That is a fiscal policy. So some countries, some governments, they rely more uh, on the fiscal policy where the state is very active, proactive and very reactive. But then we have also a second remote control is called monetary policy. In the monetary policy, the state is not uh, cut off, the state is not silent, but the state is not very much into day-to-day -day affairs, but rather than going too much and doing asking people to do this or that, asking companies to do this thing, produce this, don't produce that, the state is managing the affairs by its one representative, which basically is an autonomous body, but basically it's not really autonomous, not fully autonomous. Uh, the state has a lot of influence on it. And that is called central bank of the country. Central banks have a history. To my knowledge, the first central bank, which the world saw was uh, Rick's Bank of Sverige Bank and, uh, in, in Sweden, the, the, the Royal Bank of uh, Sweden. And that was about 400 years ago, followed by Bank of England and so on and so forth. Some countries have a specific bank, the central bank of the country, which is running the show with the demand supply of money, basically. But in some countries, there's no one bank, but there is a system. Like if you ask me, which is the central bank of UK? I would say Bank of England, but there's no parallel of Bank of USA. <laughs> but for that, we have a system, not a bank, and that is called Federal Reserve System, FRS. If you look at some dollar note, you will see the Federal Reserve. It's a system of banks which run the show, not one bank. 
the idea here is that you can run the economic show, the economic affairs of the country by the monetary policy, by the fiscal policy. In the fiscal policy, the state is more visible. In the monetary policy, the state is not too much into the picture, but the bank, the central bank of the country uh, is more acting basically uh, at the behest of the state, at the instructions of the state. Okay, so the first thing we shall study today is the monetary policy. I will not be able to finish both. Uh, I will only uh, take care of the monetary policy today if I could complete it. The monetary policy is carried out through the actions of the central bank or any other monetary authority, like there is a Federal Reserve System in the US that control the quantity of money in an economy and the channels through which the money is supplied. So basically, the fine tuning of the economy is done by the state through the two systems. So, and the one is the money supply, the state can increase or decrease the money supply, and the state can increase the de and decrease the money supply, like supply of anything. You see, in the last chapter, you have studied demand and supply, right? And you know the supply, the supply curve. The price goes up, supply goes up. The price goes down, supply goes down. So basically, the state have a control over the money supply. And the state has also can maneuver with the cost of money. The cost of money is called interest rates. So by playing, by fiddling with the supply of money and the cost of supply of money, which is interest rate, the state can act according to the situation. And the state can achieve, and why, what is the purpose of the state doing this thing? Because the state has some predefined objectives. The central bank, which is a state's representative, even though it's comparatively free body, uh, it has its objectives. And the objective is, number one, controlling the inflation. Inflation to be controlled. Now, I want to ask you, I want somebody to tell me, what do you mean by inflation? What do you think inflation is? Can I say something? Yeah, yes, Zara. Uh, well, uh, uh... In Iran, actually, we have lots of experience in this regard. Mm -hmm. uh, it means the power of a unique uh, currency mm -hmm. during the time is going down. Like, uh, for example, you can uh, buy a milk uh, in this month by two euro, and next month you can uh, buy by those uh, two euros just half of a liter of milk. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So it, this okay. way, the power of the currency is going down. Yes, well said. So the by inflation, we mean that with the with the price increase, the value of the money goes down. So if the state, so if there is inflation, and if state is supplying more money, will it add fuel to the fire or will it be doing something good? Now there is inflation. And inflation is when there's too much of money chasing too few goods. We have this kind of phrase that inflation is when too much money is chasing too few goods. And if the central bank of the country increases money supply at this situation, is this bank, is the central bank going, uh, is doing a service or disservice to the nation? His service. So as you said very clearly, that in the current scenario, when we see the inflationary, you know, very strong symptoms, not only symptoms, but we see the inflation in, in reality, the state should control the money supply. Tell me something. When some things supply is cut short, what would happen to its price? If there is a less supply of furniture, if there is less supply of uh, food,
food if there is less supply of anything what would happen to its price the price goes up what is the price of money when the state reduces money supply see the situation there is inflation look at my <laughs> gestures too much money chasing too few goods state need to do what now wait a sec decrease the money supply decrease the money supply okay but when the money supply is decreased like the supply of chairs are decreased what will happen to the price of chairs the price may increase and what will happen value their currency by their own users. Yeah. Uh, some, not fully. Like, for example, let's say, even though it's a different question, but I, I want to answer you. Imagine that there is, I'm just making a figure out of my head. Imagine there is a Euro 3 trillion in Finland. It doesn't mean that there'll be 3 trillion euros worth gold in the good old days, when we used to have the coins, the gold coins, the gold coin used to do two things. The gold coins are used as coins and also as a commodity, gold. You could take gold coins to the mint and ask the guy who's working in the mint, can you melt it? Because I want to melt it and make some ornaments for my friends and family. They would do it. And if you have the gold, you go to the mint and say, can you make these uh, bracelet into the coin? I'm just making an exaggerated example. You see my point? So they, the world has seen when uh, it was 100% backed by gold. But then what happened? That there is a lot of damage of gold during the process. You know, see, after all, when you convert the gold to coins or coin to gold, there's some damage, right? And then there's also fear that somebody would take money, steal money from you. You see what? Then what they did, they said, okay, don't circulate the gold, but create the paper notes equivalent to the gold coin. But then that was also a problem. Because in by that way, only rich country would have more money and the poor country would never have. Then they said, okay, not fully, maybe 50%, maybe 60%. And then they slowly took away gold quite significantly and replaced it by American dollars. You get my point? The US dollar. Then the US dollar was feeling too much of pressure and heat like it's facing now. Then they had a basket of the hard currencies in the world. Yeah? which means not just don't put all the burden on on the usd but share it with some other currencies uh, that included gbp the pound sterling yeah swiss franc and so on and so forth and then as this was not enough <laughs> then they realize that even that is difficult because some countries cooperate imaginarily uh, let's say uh, Switzerland and USA cooperate, but Britain is not cooperating. They have their own crisis to handle. Why should they take responsibility? Like if you have an assignment and you're five people, why should three people take responsibility? Why not two? And then one person start shirking away and there's a problem. And then they said that, hey, forget about the country's individual, have a body, have a institution called International Monetary Fund, IMF. You know that? Yeah, there is a body. It's not World Bank. It's called IMF. Then IMF took the responsibility. Yeah, that we would issue some certificates which would be used by the countries to issue the money supply. And then uh, towards the end of the last century, the world saw a big development, and that was formation of European Union. And then we had our own bank, European Central Bank, headquartered in Brussels. 
You see the point? Then they took, even though now Finland is a part of EU, many policies which Finland implements, they are implemented in Brussels. And they are valid, applicable, uh, binding to all the countries, member nations, right? But there is a central bank, Suomi Panki, based in Helsinki, that also can you know, play its own role. So it can customize the policies. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you said there's uh, applicable rules to all the countries in the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the countries that are in the EU or were in the EU but don't uh, use the euro currency? Well, uh, and, yeah, 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 I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I think that that's a very valid question. Some countries, uh, they are part of EU, but they don't want to. They have a, well, it's, technically it doesn't really matter because it's an exchange rate between that, like, for example, a Swedish kroner uh, and EU, and they're, it's quite flexible. It's uh, not flexible. Um, it's flexible, but not too much changing. So more or less, the, it's a stable exchange rate. Uh, some countries have a reasoning that they don't they don't want to replace their uh, traditional currency because they have they might have some emotions attached to it. When it was this question was asked to the uh, what is that that guy who is called uh, Treasury uh, yeah the, the 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 head of Exchequer uh, in in UK that what is the reason. Why you want to have pound? Why not euro when all the major countries, Germany, France, all the rich, I'm talking about the big countries, okay? They have agreed, Italy, uh, they have agreed to move to EU. And this guy said, his, 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 his explanation is very funny. He said, it is because of this thing. Legacy, history, we feel proud of GBP. For the last 1100 plus years, pound sterling is the only currency in the world which has never come to halt, which has been circulating continuously. Still has a higher value than. Euro, mm -hmm. so why would they downgrade essentially? Question is not higher or low value. Question is not that. It's not the value which matters. It's a change in the value which matters. If we agree, if we agree that your one asset equal to my two assets, and we form this equation, the problem is not that I'm a bad economy and I have less value. No, we set a we set a rule. By that logic, Swiss Swiss franc has much higher value. Used to have much higher value in the past. The point here is that. The point here is that. If we agree that your one asset equal to my two assets, in the future. If it happens that one of your asset equal to my three assets, the rate of exchange is one is to three, then I have to worry. And if in the future, the exchange rate between you and me is not one to two, but one to 1.5, then you have to worry, even though the value of your asset is still higher than mine. So it's not the value which per se, which matters. It is a change in the value which matters, okay? For example, if you look at the stock markets, even though we are going away from the main topic, but it's good discussion, good positive distraction. If you see the most successful companies in the world in the stock markets, they have the highest change in the value, but their stock prices do not necessarily the highest in the stock exchange. For example, let me, Right. If there's a two companies, right? Company A, company B. Yesterday, time zero, 
the stock price of this company was $12,000. Yesterday, the stock price of this company was $120. All you can say is that the value of one share of this company is higher than the value of the A company share is higher than the value of B, right? But see what happens. Next day, that is time one today, the price increased by $10. And here also, the price increased by $10. Which company grows faster? Here we go. This matters. Because here, what's going on here? I hope there's no tremor or something. Hmm? Can somebody check for me? Is that there's going to be some? The rate of increase here, let me guess, it's about 8%. And the rate of increase here would be maybe 0 0.0008. Investors would become richer here, not here, even though the stock value is higher. So it's not the value per se which matters. It's the relative value, the relative change matters. So therefore, just because a country's currency's value is more doesn't make it a hot favorite currency. It's a change in the value which matters. Okay. All right. Here we go. So yes, uh, the money supply goes down. I think with that we we're discussing uh, if there's inflation. Uh, but I was asking you that what happens when the supply of something is cut short? What happens to its price? And you said the price goes up. And what is the price of money? The price of money is the interest rate. The price of the money is interest rate. Therefore, when the money supply is cut short, the interest rate goes up. Tell me something. When the price of share increases, does it discourage people to borrow the chair or encourages? When the price of chair goes up, does it encourages or discourages the consumer to buy chair? Discourages, obviously. When the interest rate goes up, which is price of money, it, discour it discourages people to borrow. And then what happens? When there's less borrowing, Less money is spreaded. And less money spreaded means less money supply. Less money supply means now there's no too much money chasing too few goods. And as a result, the inflation can be controlled. According to ECB guidelines, if in the EU area, the inflation in a country is more than 2%, it's a threat. It's a threat. This is a problem. And the, you can see that the inflation already is going up in many, uh, in many countries. So th this, this can be a big problem. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're right, uh, Zara, when you said that when there is uh, too much money supply uh, chasing too few goods, uh, there is inflation, or if you double the money supply, uh, the price will be doubled, but the value of the money would be half. So inflation causes uh, less value of money. And what other objective the central bank has? Fostering growth. We want to foster the growth. We want to increase the output. We want to increase the efficiency. Do you get my point? Uh, monetary policy can be expansionary and uh, contractionary. Expansionary is when there is a recession. When there is a recession. You know what is recession? Recession is uh, like uh, the problem when the economy is going down. 
uh, income is falling, output is falling, employment is falling, no production, factories are getting shut, labor are given, this pink slip, go home, we don't need you. There's no job opportunity. That is called recession. In that case, somebody has to activate the economy, ignite the economy. And how would you ignite the economy? You want people, businesses to come and borrow from the bank. You see what? And then what, what the, uh, the bank does? The bank would cut down the cost of borrowing, which means the interest rate will go down. And when the interest rates go down, what people do? Borrow for two purposes. Businessmen would borrow so that they find it cheaper to invest. You get my point? And the consumers will also borrow because at a low interest, now it's less amount of money they have to pay as a mortgage for the house. Uh, the interest rate is nearly negative, zero. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Um, you know, then they find that, hey, it's much easier to buy a house or buy a car. Then what happens? When, start, when people start buying houses, the housing market, construction work, go up. When, when the companies are investing money in their, uh, in their businesses, there's more production, more demand for raw material, more people employed, and somewhat expansionary cycle starts in the economy. I don't say that it, it always does, but it is expected that this is, this is how the economy would react. So to combat, to combat the recession, the, the central bank of the country follows the expansionary monetary policy. Are you all with me? You understand what I'm talking? Is it too complicated? It's too complicated. <laughs> Which part is complicated? Can you point out? I can, I can explain again. Okay, so should I start again, the lesson? Huh? Okay, so there is a, uh, there is a, if you want that economy is down, you need to cut down the cost of borrowing. People borrow, when people borrow, they buy things, and when they buy things, there is a expansion in the economy. On the other hand, economy is overheated I mean, the, you go to the market and you find that the prices are soaring high. And the one symptom why prices are soaring high is that people have too much money in their pockets. They can easily borrow from the banks. Hey, we need to stop it. Nordia is giving too much money to the potential borrowers. They go to the showroom to, to these, uh, uh, you know, the different, uh, companies and they want to buy the car, but the cars are not, the supply of car is not picking up. As a result, the prices of cars are going up. So we need to tell Nordea to cut down their lending and how they discourage lending. They, they can't just chuck people out. Uh, hey guys, the interest rate has gone up now. Next day, less people will go to Nordea to borrow. Less people borrow from money from the Nordia, less people will go to the showrooms, less cars would be demanded. And, and as a result, the, the, the demand pressure would be released. So this is how the monetary policy functions. If you want to combat the recession, make it more expansionary. And if you want to make it uh, uh, to, to cut short inflation, then make it contractionary. Like now, uh, the, the banks are discouraging people from borrowing by, uh, you know, uh, by, 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 by raising the interest rate. And see what, see the beauty. With the increase in the interest rate, people are discouraged to borrow. This point is very important because this would help you to recall everything. With the increase in the interest rate, people are discouraged to borrow. When they borrow less, there is less pressure of demand over supply. Agree with me? But imagine you have your own money. You, it's not the borrowing, it's in your pockets. Hey, I don't care about the interest rate. 
I have my, my pockets are stuffed with uh, euros. I can go and buy. But then what happens when the interest rate goes up? It encourages you to keep the money with the bank because you get more income. Imagine until yesterday, you had 100,000 euros in your pocket and the interest rate was 0%. So if you keep money with the bank, you get nothing. But now you have the same amount of money and the interest rate goes to 3%. Look, the opportunity cost of money is now more. If you consume, if you spend money on buying something, you are losing 3% rate of interest. And then you compare, hey, why am I buying it? Why don't I keep the money with the bank? So on the one hand, people deposit their own money with the bank. And on the other hand, people can't borrow more money from the bank. Therefore, the extra pressure of demand over supply could be maintained, could be, could be controlled. This is the job of the central bank. So the central bank follows the expansionary policy and the contract. This is why I use the word fine tuning, depending upon the situation. They fine tune. And how they play with? They play with the money supply and they play with the cost of money supply, interest rate. They can't play with the demand for money because they can't come and tell you to do what, what to do and what not to do. That is your choice. If you still want to borrow at a high interest rate, it's your problem. So demand for money is not in the control of the bank. But the bank has a control over supply of money and the cost of money. You got the idea? Okay. Uh, basically, monetary policy is again a symptom, is a reflection of the price mechanism. I want to show you something. We talk about the price mechanism. Did we talk in the last chapter? Okay. I think it's a good idea to recall. If it's a demand for coffee. Um, so demand for coffee, supply of coffee. This is the price of coffee. The price of coffee can increase by two ways. The one is that the demand for coffee increases. And as a result, the price of coffee increases. The quantity of coffee was this much, but now the quantity of coffee is this much. The price of coffee is more. Bad thing, coffee is expensive. Bad thing or good thing? Price of coffee, if you are a consumer of coffee, price of coffee is good thing or bad thing? Price increase, okay. What is a good thing in this picture? The economy is growing. Look, the economy is growing. We can, we can remorse, we can cry, we can yell, we can complain, we can mumble and grumble. But what is good thing? Whenever the price increases because of demand pressure, it's a good thing, relatively. I, look, don't judge me in the absolute sense. Comparatively, it's not so bad thing. But look at the situation. This is the demand for coffee. This is supply of coffee. The price of coffee is OP, this one, yeah. So the price is OP, the quantity is OQ. One other way, one other way the price of coffee can increase is that there is a shortage of supply. Supply is less. The price jumps to OP2. But guess what happens? The quantity also goes down to. <clears throat> when the price was rising because of 
the demand factor the blessing in this guys was that the countries there was a growth at least so there was inflation but there was some growth also but what is the problem here there is inflation and there is a contraction in the growth as well so it means this is called demand pull inflation low inflation is good but comparatively this is a good inflation uh somebody raised hand let me ask i come back to this picture again this one number one number one picture this one, let's call it number two picture there's a demand curve d i i just let's call, call it demand for coffee we can take one product at a time demand for coffee is dc i mean if, if it looks like c for example and the supply of coffee is sc the demand for coffee and supply for coffee they meet at a point e e stands for equilibrium the price of coffee per kilo is op and in the whole economy there's a oq amount of coffee available so this is the coffee amount oq you can see the q here the price is op this much here um supply doesn't change but people start liking coffee more than before demand for coffee increases there can be many reasons demand for coffee shifts to d1 so now there's a new demand for coffee the equilibrium is not at e but the equilibrium is at e1 now the price of coffee jumps to op1 here this op1 there's a more price of coffee bad thing as mohammed said it's a bad thing price is more we pay more price but if you look in more general terms the one good thing is that the people who produce coffee they're very happy about it <laughs> yeah they are able to supply more coffee this is a, the rising price look the business people they don't want to get some national award that the state should invite them in helsinki give them some award awards they should be getting some certificates no for the businesses a best reward is give them the price increase cost is constant at a given time with the more price the revenue increases and as a result the profits increase so this is a good motivation for the suppliers to produce more coffee guess what the price is high consumers can be unhappy but people who work in the factories uh coffee employment has increased then coffee people uh, when more jobs available in the coffee uh they would get more wages more jobs then they would consume more they will go to uh, some other stores and there there is a circular there is a kind of recovery process will start you know you get my point so mohammed the point i was trying to make is that the bad thing is that inflation is more what does it make let me draw the picture the bad thing is that consumers are unhappy what did i make them happy actually what i'm doing the consumers are unhappy but the good thing is that people who work in the coffee sectors they are happy and their prosperity would go elsewhere does it make sense mohammed did you understand my point or not you can you can yes. unmute yourself and say yes if i understood correctly you mean one thing is bad but another thing is many job opportunities is created exactly. and the income of people will raise up as a result the economy of a, of a country is also you uh, increase you understood very well now you can mute yourself now see this pic picture number 2 demand is d as before supply is s equilibrium is e like before but this time the price of coffee has increased not because demand has went up but because supply has gone down there can be problem in the factories raw material become expensive labor is not available the government have imposed taxes 
as a result the cost of coffee has increased and the coffee is no longer a profitable occupation uh, the price of coffee goes up okay like before consumers are very unhappy but so are the other people look everyone is unhappy now consumers are sorry what i'm doing i think i, I should learn the drawing before i'll teach economics uh what do i do <laughs> yeah no no sorry so let me erase it yeah and have this drawing so consumers are unhappy because the price they pay more price but the workers everybody in the in the coffee sector is also unhappy nobody is happy here the coffee price has gone up and the coffee quantity has gone down as well and this kind of inflation is called cost push inflation cost push inflation first of all inflation is not a very good thing but if i have to choose between uh, the the fire and the fire pan then i i will select that combination uh, where the it pains less so if you have to choose between a bigger evil and a lesser evil then we choose the lesser evil and which seems to be the lesser evil this, this in this situation demand pull inflation or cost push inflation demand pull inflation is a better inflation cost push inflation is a diabolic inflation because it is why because on the one hand it increases the price inflation it also decrease the output recession see what in this picture you see the inflation and recession same time do you see inflation and recession here here there is inflation but there is also expansion there is there is a growth you with me and here there is inflation but there is also recession this is exactly happening right now because the current inflation that we see is not demand pull it's cost push the states are confused it's i am more sympathetic to people who are the uh, economists who are making the policies should they check the prices or should they ensure that if they check the prices they are not harming the growth of the country if they do something to check the prices uh, uh, to pull the prices there's a there's a danger that they can create recession so on the one hand uh, people are losing jobs but on the other hand the inflation is also rising so we have two evils at the same time this situation uh, please remember i i might have forgotten to discuss with you this very dangerous inflation we use the phrase stagflation stagflation is a very bad word i wish the economies don't suffer from this it's like a patient whose energy level is going down but also having the high blood pressure if you are giving the glucose or you know to to put the energy level up to energize him or her then the blood pressure also increases at the same time so you give one medicine it treats one disease but it reacts negatively to the other disease it's like that so you do something to check inflation then you will be harming the growth if you do something to harm the to to increase the growth like for example to increase the growth the bank might reduce interest rate and make credit available to the businesses but if they do if they do so then the prices will go up you see my point and if they try to cut down the inflation and make the credit the the loans very strict uh banks raise interest rates 
then the problem is that the business people will not be able to borrow. They will not be able to keep the salaries of, they will not be able to pay salaries of the staff. They will not be able to carry on the daily operations of the factories. They have to shut down. So it's like a one step forward, two steps backward situation. So, and I tell you something, I have no hesitation in saying that at the moment, we are suffering from stagnation, a very dangerous situation. So monetary people, people who work in Helsinki, people who work in Brussels, these macroeconomists, these finance, Harvard educated, whosoever they are, they are having a very tough time. They're having very tough time. Every, and they're also scared of making decisions because the financial media is sitting outside. They're judging them every second. One small move, they are, they are afraid of experimenting. They're afraid of taking bold decisions. Why so? Because people are there to judge them. You see my point? Therefore, if you have a bigger crown, make sure that the crown is not made of thorns because it will hurt you. It will hurt your head. Heavier the crown, more headache you have. So people who are at the helm of affairs, they sometimes find very, 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 very much vulnerable. You know, so this is the problem. And as I said before, that this is something we are struggling with at the moment. The stagflation is something which we are having. Uh, I have no problem that we, in the entire lesson, I have no problem that we only covered one slide in the entire lesson. But the beautiful thing is that we are able to see a very big picture, which the central banks have to grapple day in, day out, that the decision-making becomes very cumbersome, very difficult, very challenging. But now I hope that some shades uh, of thoughts you have started developing about the monetary policy. It's about supply of money. It's about the interest rate. If you try to increase money supply because you want to help the businesses by lowering the interest rate, you would be doing good to the businesses, but the problem is that there would be inflation in the market. But if you try to combat the inflation by making the loans very strict, high interest rate, but then the problem is that the business people would suffer like anything. They would be huge. They would be totally, the cash flow would be totally uh, shattered. So we are in a catch 22 situation. What to do? and what not to do. Mm -hmm. And then with the pressure from the electoral, pressure from the stakeholders, uh, we may end up doing something stupid, which aggravates the problem. But thank you so much. Uh, this is a starting point. Uh, we need one more lesson. And in that lesson, we would be covering monetary and fiscal policy both next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>